already now, please share your questions uh, in the chat. Otherwise, I'll just let uh, the word over to uh, you, Jesper, in the beginning and then afterwards uh, you, Mette, just to set the scene a little bit related to this, uh, to this topic. So uh, I'll give the word to you, Jesper, uh, with the opportunity to yeah. set the scene related to this topic. Thank you very much. I have prepared a few slides and uh, I think you can ask for a copy afterwards if you want, because I'm going to have to go quite fast through them. Uh, so I've been asked to talk about uh, what is the thinking if, if you're a business angel facing this COVID crisis. So the next two slides we will skip uh, very quickly past. Kent? Yeah, that's my CV and that's about Danish business angels. Uh, yeah, so you carry on. So it's not business as usual. And uh, those of us who, who uh, work with companies, you know, there's a process to make annual budgets. And on March 11th in Denmark, at least, you could take all those budgets and throw out the window because we went into lockdown. Uh, so that means that you had a plan for 2020 and uh, now you don't have a plan. So you need a new plan, but to make a, a new plan, you have to have what I call a guiding light. Next slide, yeah. And uh, the, uh, the guiding light is about survival. Uh, it, it's about helping uh, the wounded. And I make this analogy that you're a doctor in a MASH hospital. And uh, what you have to do is you have to allocate your time and the resources uh, to do the, the triage as it's called. So to do that, you, you know, you have to decide who lives and who dies. Obviously, you want as few as possible to, to die. In my case, I have 46 investments. 26 are direct and 20 are through business angel funds. And I'm chairman in seven of those 26. So on some of the patients, I have good colleagues, other business angels. They're doing their bit. And obviously, where I'm chairman, I'm doing uh, my bit. So we go to the next slide. And uh, here I say that the guiding light, you know, uh, if you'd asked me uh, about a week ago, I had a different guiding light. And so I say, this is the April 7, 2020 version. And it's subject to change because we, as, as every day passes, we, we learn a little bit more about uh, what we are looking into. So the first thing is we are living in a society that looks like it has flattened the curve which is very good news in terms of, of, of minimizing the number of people who will die. If you look at the history, it, it, it seems that, uh, you know, uh, we can be there, you know, uh, within 12 weeks from lockdown. That was the good news. The bad news is that a, a, a vaccine, according to the medical experts, I'm not an expert, but I have tried to gather information on this. It takes 12 to 18 months. And um, so until we have a vaccine, life cannot return to normal. In all that period, there will be a continuous risk of new spikes in infections and deaths. And the worst case scenario is that you have a period of lockdown, lock up, lockdown, lock up, which will be extremely frustrating for everyone. And so I think there's a grounds for very big caution in these next 12 to 18 months. And this is what I call a transition period. Um, so this means we have to adopt a modus operandi, which is suited to the transition period. Next slide. So uh, when you're doing triage, you know, it's resources and time. And time is when can a return to normal be expected? And resources is, is the money, whatever the source of the money is. So when you're doing triage, you have to look at this on a company by company basis. And there's a huge difference in the immediate effect of COVID-19. In my portfolio, I have one company that actually since March 11 has been, has been doing better than ever before. It has the government sector as customers. It, it uh, develops IT systems. You know, all these contracts will continue. The programmers have been sent home. And so they're more productive than when they sat in the office. Great stuff. At the other end, I have a company which used to serve 13,500 meals per day to companies. Five days later, they were down to 1,500, 90% cut. You know, so therefore, it is, it is like the war. There are soldiers still fighting, no problem. And there are others who are very heavily uh, wounded. 
So you need to look at your portfolio and you need to develop a portfolio COVID-19 index, i.e. are we at 100 or are we at zero in terms of the patient health? Next slide. Yeah. Um, so how sick is the patient and how can we help the patient? And so you need to start doing scenario planning for the rest of 2020. And obviously the first objective is to ensure that the company has liquidity through December 31, 2020. And I would say that the objective of this scenario modeling is you should be looking at a model where you are generating positive cash flow in Q4. Because if you can get to that, this means that if the transition period turns out to be longer than 12 or 18 months, you're going to be in a good position. If by the end of Q4, you're still not in positive liquidity, you know, you are then facing a crisis the longer the transition period is. So what you need to do is you need to do these scenarios now and you need to right size now. Uh, before you right size too heavily, you, you have to understand what is the access to state edge packages. When I look at portfolio companies, the value of the packages that have been put forward so far differs a lot. But the, common, uh, the commonality is that none of them uh, uh, individually or in total are enough to alleviate the problem. So you, you still have a problem. What do you then do? You have to determine in each company what are the available shareholder funds you know, how strong is, is your shareholder base? How, how willing are they to support the company? Also, you have to work with your bank. Many of these uh, state initiatives, they go through the bank. So the dialogue actually starts there. Uh, so it starts with the shareholders and the bank. And uh, of course, your, your ability to conduct those talks depends on your ability to inspire confidence with those two stakeholders. So do you have a credible plan to get through the transition period. Next slide. So, um, what? How about surviving as a? I mean, business angel. As I said, num number one task is you have to do the triage on your portfolio. Until that is done, and and you know how big trouble you're in, or your investments are in, your appetite for new investments is going to be low. The exception is just like the the venture fund or private equity fund that just raised all their capital. We call them virgin angels. And if you're a cash rich, rich virgin angel, she or he is in heaven right now because you're going to have, you know, all the choices you want to invest during the coming year. And all experience shows that the best startups are created in times of crisis. So, you know, the virgin angels, it's a fortunate time for them. And now is the time to build that winning portfolio. Next slide. So what can startups do? Turning to the startups, uh, prediction, all past experience, there will be a massive drop in angel investing. Angels have different assets. A lot of them have a lot of listed shares. They will have seen the value of their listed shares fall dramatically in Q1. So if they were only allocating 10% of their wealth to uh, uh, startups, suddenly this percentage maybe is 15 or 20 because the other assets dropped. So they won't have a big appetite. And if they haven't finished the triage, they're busy doing this. So everyone knows this and no one wants it to happen. We do not want to lose a generation of startups. So what can the startups do? Well, well, one thing they can do is to realize that, that the valuations will drop a lot. So the short version is get real. You know, it's going to be a different scenario to 2018 and 2019. Next slide. Um, and uh, no, back one. That's it. Uh, and if you look at how did, I mean, Denmark do specifically after 2009, the truth is we did exceptionally poorly. You can see here, these are the number of uh, gazelles. You can see that in 2018, which is the last graph, we still had fewer gazelles than, than before Lehman Brothers. And the 2019 was lower than 2018. Who knows what 2020 will be? So I think this shows that the external parameters for doing startups in Denmark are very poor. They continue to be poor. Um, so, you know, we cannot uh, fix that on our own. So we need to ensure that the angels, the banks and the state 
share an understanding of the issues and collaborate. And if you look at the banks in 2009, they were the problem. They were in danger of going under. Right now, they are extremely healthy. So banks can be part of the solution in 2020. The state, Denmark is one of only um, uh, nine AAA rated OECD countries. So we have the resources to emerge from this crisis if we act smart. We can actually take a lead. Uh, and, and the way we do that is, you know, um, is to talk with each other, not to shout at each other, to help you know, connect the dots and we can really get you know, through this crisis in a good way. Next, just to finish off, what has um, Adanban been doing since March 11? We basically switched all pitch events from physical to virtual, and we ha have adapted the format of our pitch events. So we do fewer startups and we do more frequent events. We have released three videos where experienced angels share their experiences from past crises, you know, dot com, Lehman Brothers, to help the, uh, our members understand what they should be doing. We've increased the number of, I mean, newsletters, and we are collecting war stories to help model aid packages from the state. And the final slide, I think. Yeah. What are we doing to help the startups? Uh, we, we work on the advocacy side through DVCA, the Davis Venture Capital Association, and we have sent three catalogs of measures to the government since March 16. And we're working on the fourth one. Uh, next one is a Dan Van partner. We have a very close co collaboration with them. And we're hoping to develop relevant new instruments, not least on the equity side, uh, to help the startups get through this. So, you know, one, one proposal, which I think we should, you know, try to follow, is this a UK idea of a runway fund, which would provide up to half a million euros to startups through convertible loan notes. And actually, if you look at that mechanism, this, may, this means we could perhaps save a lot of startups and the state could end up, just like the bank packages, actually making a profit from it when we get to liquidity events in 2021. Kent, I think that was it. Thank you uh, a lot, Jesper, for sharing and some uh, some really good points already and some really interesting areas also to touch upon in the in the Q and A session uh, for sure. Uh, so thank you a lot, Jesper. Then I'll give the words to you, Mette, from a personal perspective. How uh, how does a business angel act in these days? Um, well, as an impact investor, I can tell you we are not panicking. Not, not yet. That, that's, that's good for to sure. hear. Yeah. So uh, impact investing is all about responsibility and return. I think that's that's very important to 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 sort of establish the fact that, that being an investor is an investor. So even though we do invest in purpose-driven businesses, me and my peers and the group I work with, we always have the same focus as everybody else in the private equity world, and that is return. So much of what Jesper has just uh, talked about and thank you Jesper that was just brilliantly summed up what 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 I see in my world also will will of course apply also to the to to the impact investor um, what I see from a personal angle then I'm not sitting on top of a multi thousand membership organization but I do have quite a lot of people that I co-invest with and advise on and uh, work with is is also what I've what I've heard Jesper say my portfolio is, uh, is surrounding about 20 businesses right now, where five or six of them are pure impact businesses, meaning that their core product or service is purely uh, meant to do good and earn money, of course. Uh, so, so it's sort of the same portfolio size as Jesper is talking about. Um, what I hear in the business right now, in the groups I'm joining, is a strong belief that we will survive this crisis and that we have to continue investing uh, the way we did before the crisis also. So to sustain long-term impact, we cannot stop and wait half a year to invest in the businesses. So I concur with what you say, Jesper. Of course, as investors, we need to consolidate own portfolio. We need to look at whether the businesses we are already helping, already uh, invested in, whether we can do more. 
on those businesses, but we cannot stop the dialogue. So that is actually my first taking to you guys today is please reach out, even though we are in the midst of a crisis. And I can see that you are reaching out because the amount of pitches coming in, the amount of invitation for a virtual coffee has increased tremendously throughout the last two or three weeks. So, so I'm happy to see that. Uh, and, and please do not stop. But be aware that the dialogue might drag out. And normally we will, well, we will engage in dialogue and it can take all the way up to a year to, to do an investment in an impact business because many of these are science-based or educational based and will take time to understand them as with other businesses. And that can actually take longer now because we need to look at the liquidity situation also on our own side, as Jesper also mentioned. So a consolidation of our portfolio, the one we already are in, the one we are already helping, is not looking only at the businesses and how they can survive and how we can help them as angels. It's of course also looking at our own situation, how deep are our pockets right now, how is the liquidity, liquidity situation on our side. What I have seen though is that uh, if you look at the group of investors, within the impact businesses, you will have the major, major, major investors. We're talking family offices. We are also talking VCs, but now we are on the private equity part. So I'm talking people. If you have a rather large fortune, it seems like people are just investing as they did to yesterday, more or less. I haven't seen any dialogues with the uh, possible investments that I'm involved in with, with different kinds of groups that have stopped, hadn't come to a halt. But that, of course, is because of the fortune size of the people that are involved. If you have 300,000 Danish crowns or perhaps 100,000 euros to invest, and you just lost more or less your entire fortune on the established market, of course, you will stop and make it a halt. So another taking from today, dear, dear companies out there looking for funding, please do your homework before you approach investors right now. I know you might be desperate because you're in the midst of a funding round and you might have had 20 dialogues ongoing and suddenly people are closing them down because of this situation. But now more than ever, the work of doing due diligence on the investor you approach, it's more important than ever. Find out how large this investor's portfolio is, how deep their pockets is right now midst Corona crisis because it will make it much more easier finding the right ones. And that is actually a part that I have seen on the impact world, but also on the established world uh, or non-impact, non-purpose driven world where you're sort of shooting a bit everywhere to find funding. You need to think now a lot when you are seeking funding. So that's what I'm saying here. So consolidation of own portfolio is ongoing. Uh, it is definitely not something that will stop or a halt or only take a week more depending on how large the angels portfolio is review of own liquidity well we're still losing money on the established markets so so of course this will also have a long time effect as as Jesper is also saying but another area that i see is actually focus and i'm talking on the angel part uh, i see quite a few of my peers in the impact world um, taking this situation and actually embracing it because now you can't invest small amounts everywhere. You have to actually think deeper on exactly what is your own focus. And that has actually been a bit of a problem in the impact world uh, from, from the investor side that a lot of impact or purpose driven investors. And it's been, you know, it's been an amazing year last year and the year before, because this is the new hype. We need to invest in sustainable businesses. And those are the new, not unicorns, but zebras. Uh, and, and, and it seems like a lot of investors really haven't found their focus. Do I want to invest on the social area? Do I want to invest in environment or energy? And I think this is the situation where you will see in the investors finding their focus. I see a lot of people reaching out to me and my peers to get advice. We are not virgin investors, virgin angels. I love that term, Jesper. Thank you for introducing that. Uh, I don't want to be called mature either. Then I'm just old. So, uh, investor, but, investor. 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 Oh, I like it. <laughs> so, uh, but, but we do have some experience and I see a lot of virgin investors reaching out for advice on how to find your focus because 
now I can only invest in one company or five companies the last next couple of years. So I need to find the right focus. So the trends right now is a cautious opportunism because we know the good deals are coming. We know the valuation will drop. And I think it's about time for those valuations to go a bit lower than they were before, also on the impact part. So there is an opportunism from the business angel size that we can actually find some good deals now that can be of good, do of good, but also have focus on return. So I think that's good. And then of course we see an enhanced focus on the social area. Well, it goes without saying that the businesses having some kind of social focus right now will thrive. Uh, and social is a huge area looking at the ESGs or the SGGs or the other sustainability me measurements of sustainability. It is a huge area social, but that is where we see the boom. We see the boom in uh, robotics. Uh, just look at Blue Ocean back home where they actually have their IVD robot. Uh, that, that has boomed tremendously. Uh, also on care, uh, care clue, clue down in France, uh, which is a, a social robot aiming at retirement homes and non insulation of, of, of old people in retirement rooms. Uh, so we see a boom of that. We see a lot of social platforms coming up. We see a lot of education and communication being able to spread the word on Corona and, and how to act and live in this world. And then you can ask yourself, is a communication platform a social investment? Well, right now it is. It might not have been a month ago, but right now it's an impact business. Welcome to the new world, guys. So that's a new category we are actually also creating mid crisis. So an enhanced focus on social. I see a cautious enhanced fo focus on something which might be a bit of a surprise to someone, which is actually environmental uh, investments. So why would we use your our time investing in, in new energy or in other means of saving the environment right now? Well, I believe it's uh, caused by frustration. We've seen the oil prices dumped tremendously because of Russia and some of the oil states actually freeing up the oil. And I do believe that also outside the core of impact, people are frustrated to see governments actually using this means to save their own part of the world. So uh, an inspiring, uh, cautious positivism on impact uh, businesses dealing with environment is actually also out there right now. Um, so trends are forming. Some of them are obvious, social area, help each other, communication platforms, they are social suddenly, and then something new happening on the impact area of environment. What I see also uh, when consolidating old portfolio is a tremendous innovative way of thinking on the established businesses. And Jesper, you also mentioned that. Look at your own uh, product today and see if you can perhaps transform that product or service you're doing today as a startup or just use it otherwise than, than it was meant to in order to build a stronger case. And I think that is actually what is most interesting right now to see which kind of businesses we will have in half a year's time or a year's time, because it, this is fueled tremendously because of the Corona crisis. Uh, just to mention a couple of years, but you also mentioned a couple of your investments. So, uh, well, in, in my portfolio, we have an on, online platform only meant for the, uh, for the healthcare system. Well, that has boomed quite a lot. I think we had 50, thousand new subscribers in a month that that's a bit much because that was an online communication platform but we also have a company doing uh, shelters in africa in refugee camps and suddenly we can use these shelters being used as isolation wards as morgues so actually thinking your product otherwise than it was intended to uh, and i'm looking really much forward to see some of these business thriving because of the crisis opportunism again thank you a lot Mette. And uh, it's really nice with some optimism and also like a positive side of like the opportunity comes that will come out of this. Um, and I guess that's also what you're searching for in the companies and your portfolio companies is the companies who is the farthest, fastest as ac on acting on the current situation, like reforming the company and taking the right decisions uh, uh, 
like uh, taking decisions as fast as possible. So, so in your portfolio companies and the conversations you have right now, wh wh where is the conversation? What is the conversations about right now with the companies you have? Is that cost cutting? Is like finding runway? Uh, what, what, why, are you, why are you focusing right now when you're having these conversations with the companies? Uh, I can say that uh, there are two focuses, and obviously the first focus is liquidity. What is the cash outlook uh, for the coming quarter and for the rest of uh, 2020? And if you get to a conclusion that uh, you know th that you have to right size, then the, the other piece of advice is uh, do it fast and do it deep so that you don't have a salami method where you're having to chop off arms and legs uh, bit by bit, you know. Uh, so I have seen portfolio companies do that as a combination of uh, firing a number of staff and asking everyone else to take a, a pay cut for three or four months. Uh, and that is done, you know, it's, it's very painful, but the people who remain can see that, that they have now adjusted to this I mean new reality the worst thing to do is not to react uh, mm. because that way you know you lessen the probability of surviving yeah. well I concur with the for right now liquidity and survival on a financial basis of course is, is and that is goes for all businesses uh, mm. um, so we also see a lot of founders actually um, gaining a lot of experience very fast that they hadn't hoped they would gain uh, in the situation. So, so hopefully we can also see a lot of uh, very strong founders coming out of yes. this. Yes. Uh, on, on my behalf, on the portfolio I'm on top of or at, at least involved in, um, after the liquidity situation and cutting deep fast, I concur, yes, for the innovation is actually number two. It's very, very fast going in to see whether the product can do even more good or differently good than it was intended. Uh, and yes, but perhaps you can elaborate whether you see this outside the impact world also on the more traditional companies and startups, uh, which is whether this is the trend there also? Yes, certainly. And uh, there are two things. One thing is to uh, not completely, I mean, repurpose the company, but to make it r relevant uh, to the scenario we are now in. So getting back to my lunch company, uh, you know, you have to, I mean, rethink what's it like to serve food in canteens. And you can put quite a lot of thought into that because people will still want to have food, but they will be working differently when they are at, at their workplace. So therefore you're repurposing uh, the way you do your offering. Um, and then uh, uh, we, uh, there's another company, which I, I, I know you know, Mede, which is about uh, um, e-learning. Which has been sold, or which is sold to very large corporations, and obviously, you know, uh, once we have survived this, and we are going to survive, uh, we we're looking into a very thriving market mm -hmm. for this because uh, we are not going back as a society to where we were before March 11. All the things that can be done virtually have taken a huge leap forward. So the social acceptability of this is going to be completely different to what it was before and it will change our working habits. Yes. So you talked about opportunism. Well, look at your, the predictions of how we will be working together in the future and define some relevant offerings because there are going to be very big opportunities for the people who understand that first. Correctly. I, I totally concur. We, uh, I can also just definitely support that part that we see teams now like uh, taking the opportunities and, and working out with that. Also creating stronger teams uh, as we see it like going forward. Um, you talked a little bit about like moving into positive cash flow in, in Q4, Jesper. Uh, and then we talked also a little bit about uh, the liquidity and funding situation. So, so what would you, how long of a runway are you looking for in the companies? And are you focusing on that? The most of them actually become um, cash flow positive so that they there are more stability under the company or, or what are you searching for yeah uh, it's it's a kind of litmus test because if i can't do modeling and i can't get to that scenario in q4 then i seriously have to consider is this company going to survive will i support it 
through whatever because it will constantly be draining my resources. So, so th th that is why we're doing it. Okay, so let's say in the transition period, the index actually turns out to be better than you had thought. Well, uh, then you go into, and I have done this in, in one company, collecting a war chest, and we will go up, go out and pick up uh, the survivors uh, at a good price. You know, so once you have insured your own uh, survival, there are opportunities for very good transactions, and this is both the Virgin Angels, this is the experienced angels, this is everyone, because this is the time when you create the next generation of, I mean, winners. And that can happen through your portfolio companies if they're in a healthy state. So that's the reason why it's important to have that, I mean, guiding uh, light. But as I said, this was my April 7th version. It wasn't the same a fortnight ago. I probably will have a different take in 14 days and we will revisit those scenarios. We, we want the companies to be as strong as possible and to, to make them as strong as possible. But as conditions change, we have to take actions that, that, that mean that they will be that strong. And it's company by company. There is no silver bullet. There's no single solution. You, you have to look at every single company of its own merits. Really good. Point. So for the company, for the startups who has been in a kind of a fundraising process up yeah. till now, what would be your best advice matter for companies like that? Would that be uh, postponing the funding round, looking more into to cost cutting or, or how to navigate in that if you have been in a fundraising process? Um, how do you see well, that? Well, you, if you're in the midst of a fundraising process, you probably need the money for your company anyhow. So postponing wouldn't be uh, the first thing I would advise anybody to do. What I would advise is what both Jesper and I are elaborating on. Do take a deep breath. Do make sure that the product you have on the market is the right, mar the product, the right product for the right time. Do you look at the possibility of your product or service actually being able to help in the current situation? And then do your due diligence even deeper than you had before on which investors you will approach. What I will advise also is look at the initiatives we have from public side all around Europe right now. Uh, I know, Kent, that you already made a, a very, very good session with uh, the Growth Fund here in Denmark a couple of days ago. That, of course, is a particular, uh, uh, a particular um, instance for the Danish startup businesses. But we also see a lot of uh, initiatives going on right now, like Corona Fund Org uh, and European-based uh, angels and VCs going to I, I think, think we uh, lost Meta. <laughs> could we lose Meta a little bit? Or gatherings? She's back. You're back, Meta. You just, we lost uh, you just froze a couple of yeah, seconds. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> just three seconds so, or something like that. Yeah. Okay. So, so use the new possibilities to seek funding. So look, talking about the growth fronts, the local growth fronts, and the new organizations and gatherings of both angels and VCs offering funding. And then my advice would also, in particular for the purpose-driven businesses, is look for free money. Because the pools of free money right now is actually growing increasingly. We do have a lot of VCs freeing up money for what they would call philanthropic means. We saw the other tendencies before this happened, that people were actually going away from philanthropy and starting to look much more on investments. Now it's going back. We see a lot of very wealthy family offices and single persons giving huge pool of money to sustain uh, both startups and scale-ups and of course also established businesses. So there's a new source of funding that you might not have thought about and that is the funding that comes for free. Thank you, thank you a lot, Mira, and, and a really good point of maybe looking for other types of uh, funding these days where like uh, soft money could be uh, a part of that. So I, as I can see that a lot of questions has already come in, so let's try to, to jump through some of them. Uh, I thank you a lot for the activity out there. So there's a question from Eva, um, and I guess it's related to, to funding. So why will it take longer time? Uh, what are the investors doing differently now compared to pre-corona times? And why? I don't know if 
one of you who would... Well, the short answer is it, it will take a longer time because most of us are a bit more cautious today than we were three months ago. So, you know, we only and, and, have a certain amount of, I mean, dry powder. We want to spend it in the, in the wisest way possible. Yeah. And we don't know how long the transition period is, you know, so, so naturally there will be some cautious. Yeah. And, and why, why business angels are acting differently. That's, you have touched a little bit of point. They have been hit on some of their other assets, uh, oh, investments yeah. probably. Uh, and, but also I guess there's a lot of uncertainty for a lot of startups uh, looking forward on, on sales and a lot of other things that also reflects into why business angels are a little bit more cautious these days. That's what I started off by saying, you know, you have to look at your, your current portfolio first just to make sure that is everything all right. And if not, to, to take action until you've done that, you're not really going to have too much mental capacity to go into new dialogues. Yeah, I think, it, I think it's very important for the businesses out there to understand what the term a business angel actually comprises. We're in it of course for return, but we are also 100% into this game because we want to help the founders because we want to help the businesses because we want to use not only the money we might have on our bank accounts, but also our time and our competencies and our network to see these businesses thrive. And that is why it is so hurtful sitting on a portfolio of 20 odd companies and seeing them suffer as they do now. Mm. We are only in week four-ish. It does take time to consolidate a portfolio, no matter how small it might be, to make sure that that can survive before you look for new investments. So that is why you just take time, unfortunately. A really good point. So there's also a question from um, another of the attendants about to you, Jesper. So it's from from Liva, touching upon that you said that to get through this, it takes collaboration in Denmark uh, from a lot of different uh, entities. Um, could you give some examples on that? Uh, how you see um, what initiatives and examples should be made to to get us through this? Really. So there are th three main actors. There's uh, the state through, I mean, the growth fund, there is the banking sector, and there are the investors. And what we need to do is we need to make sure that the funds keep flowing to the growth sector, that they do not uh, dry up and we don't uh, lose a whole generation of startups. So since, since the private money uh, will be less, then the question is, how, how can we keep the same flow? And uh, there are two ways. One is for, I mean, the banks change the way they credit rate companies. And I know several banks have actually issued instructions internally. You, they divide the companies in three sorts. Are the red box, the green box, the yellow box. The red box, they were never going to lend any money anyway. The green box, they're okay. But in the middle now, and probably the biggest slice is the yellow box. And in just very shortly, uh, I think one of the banks, which you know very well, has said, you know, that if, if beforehand it was, if, if in doubt, say no, they've given the instruction, if in doubt, say yes. So, you know, hopefully we will see again, the banks can be part of the solution this time and not part of the problem as they were 10 years ago. The other key thing is for the state, state has enormous amounts of equity, uh, but the state does not know and should not know how to invest in the private sector, especially not in the s and sector. But if they partner up with angels, and if angels put their own money on the table, then that should be a, you know, a litmus test for saying this is a sensible investment. And the growth fund in Denmark and in other countries, they have matching schemes where you get, you know, one krona of angel uh, money releases either one krona of, uh, of public equity or public uh, lending. And what we have said and what we're in a dialogue with, you know, just to be adventurous, why not leverage it five or 10 times? Because the cost to the state of not doing anything and having thousands of, uh, I mean, bankruptcies is far larger than coming up with the equity now, but they have to do it in a safe manner. And they can do that through the angels. And some of these mechanisms actually could turn out in, in, in the medium term to generate a profit uh, for the state. So it's not charity from the state. It's actually a sensible business thing 
this is the dialogue we are in uh, with the Ministry of Commerce and the Growth Fund to find mechanisms like that which will actually work. Our big challenge is time uh, because uh, government officials are also very cautious people, just like bank people are very cautious people, and we don't have a lot of time. Thank you, Alain Jasper. Time is flying fast when we, uh, we have a lot of good topics to talk about. I think it's I hope it's for you guys okay that we expand uh, the session a little bit uh, to take a little bit more questions. Sure. Uh, there's a, a question to you, Matt, about um, so the need of impact. Um, let me see here. How in your impact investments, how, how long do you cal in calculate the Corona crisis will have effects on the economy? So, so what is your thoughts about like the time frame of of this Corona crisis and and also looking into like maybe new investments and also your portfolio companies. And I guess a lot of uh, it are uncertain still. Uh, yeah, there's a lot of uncertainties right now. We are only in the, in the beginning of, 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 of what we will uh, will see the next couple of years. Uh, I have a very, very long perspective on the effects. Uh, we have the financial effects that Jesp has already elaborated on. And I concur with the fact that we're looking into at least a year, if, if not more. Normally, I would require a, a liquidity runway of 18 months in the impact businesses I invest in. And I can see that I might compromise a bit on that, uh, just being able to invest now. But the impact of what we are seeing right now will perhaps never have an end. Let, let me formulate it like that. Because what I see now is that we have companies actually being forced to transform their existing products and services into something new. We see new product already now arising in the midst of the crisis, only focusing the areas of a pand pandemic or a health crisis of any kind. Uh, so will the effect of the Corona crisis ever end? I don't think so. We will transform into something else. Uh, and as we did during the financial crisis of 2001, 2008, 2009. So, so well, this is forever. This will change the way we look. This will change the way we have product and services in the businesses. It will change the way we sell them and it will change the way the users use them. And it doesn't have to be negative, all of it. <laughs> new opportunities, positive, new opportunity, positive exactly. opportunism, <laughs> right? Exactly. And my positive mindset. And you're also reflecting here a little bit about what is the best things maybe coming out of this uh, on the other side is like a lot of the opportunities related to actually being in a crisis, uh, as I said. There's a question related to valuation. Um, <laughs> can you explain why the valuations have to be lower uh, than pre-corona crisis? And I have just a complementary question to that. So uh, when valuation is, is dropping, uh, but the companies need the same amount of money in the company, should they then accept to to give away more of the company in, in some of the early rounds, but then messing up the cap table a little bit for the upcoming rounds, or how to, to like uh, reflect on that. So why will the valuation drop? And should you give away more of your company to get the same money or should you it's yeah. simple supply and demand. And we saw the valuations from 2016 to 2018 in this country going up by 60%. So if we assume that the rate of innovation is the same, and it might actually be higher because of all the things Meta has said that there are new uh, opportunities, etc. So if it's the same rate of innovation or higher, but the capital is less, then the mathematics of that is then valuations fall. And will that mean that you have to, quote, unquote, give away more of your company? Yes, it will. Is there a risk that it could mess up the cap tables? Yes, there is. Are angels aware of that? Yes, they are. And they also want to contribute to having a sensible cap table. So, you know, the fight comes much later on when you get to the stage maybe where the venture funds have to come in. That's where the real fight is. If the fight is not today, you know, it, Today is a dialogue mm -hmm. on sensible terms. And everybody, uh, as Meta says, the, the angels are in there to help the founders. And we usually call it clever money. It's not just money. It's network, it's competencies, etc., helping these founders. And that, that passion is still there. It's more than ever, it is, it, it is there. But we have to adjust to a, a, a new reality. And I actually 
what many were saying. I think the changes to society will be far more uh, uh, wide reaching than the dot com bubble or Lehman Brothers. I think we're looking at a whole a new way of living together uh, than you know pre corona. Um, so it's a, a, a new world with new opportunities. Super. Thank you. Just, I think, yeah. I have another question I would like to ask you, Mitty, if that's okay. Because I have two questions left. I would, I would love we, that we just managed to touch upon. So, so in this in the, in in this situation, uh, there's a question from Morton here. Uh, looking, looking beyond the current situation uh, and crisis, um, would you think that uh, out of this would come more wealthy people willing to invest as a business angel into startups to spread their risk from more traditional assets where they so so in a risk spreading uh, philosophy would would you expect that more wealthy people would look into the startup segment uh, beyond uh, this crisis yes no yes. no 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 let, let me elaborate let me elaborate <laughs> yeah. uh, we already have had quite almost a decade of hype around entrepreneurs about startups about founders and it's been amazing to be part of that as an investor. The last five or six years, we've had a slowly steeping curve on sustainability. Of course, with the UN a sustainability development goals that hyped also in the startup world. So more startups being sustainable, being impact businesses. Uh, that will not stop because of this crisis. It will only be, it will, it will only increase. And I do believe that we will see more and more investors turning towards purpose-driven businesses because that is where the return will be in the post-corona world as Jesper is, is drawing it also because it will be a different world on some very, very fixed parameters like how we work, how we eat, how we meet. It will change the world how we see it today, how we travel. Uh, and I think that will actually fuel that investors will look to alternative classes as impact investing will more than go into uh, the non-traditional impact that, you know, the startup world, the private equity world, that will remain to be seen because alternative classes and sustainable investments are also found in the banks uh, and in the investment companies uh, portfolio. But, but we can only hope that more investors will turn towards sustainability. And I believe they will. I believe focus is something everyone you know, on top of a money tank right now is, is looking at. Just one short comment. In a historical context, every time we have been through huge crises, the solidarity in society has increased. And so from that simple perspective, of yeah. course, impact investing will increase even further in the next five years than it otherwise would have done. Because history shows that is what will happen. We will move together as a human race and we have much more solidarity than we did before. Really good insights on that. And, and, and definitely also a lot of optimism and positive the thoughts going into that. Uh, so let's, let's definitely hope that we'll, uh, we'll see that. So a final question. I have a final question for both of you. So let's start with you, Jesper. Um, uh, Maybe it's the last word. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Thank you. How, how, how do find how how do founders check if an investor is still investing? So so we have touched upon that investors will now start prioritizing in their yeah. portfolios and categorize. Yeah. But how do you as a startup founder out about, finds out about that? So where do you have your investors? How do you test? I think that you simply ask out? them yeah. because yeah. Uh, uh, getting through public sources to know. Uh, the, the available amount of dry funds which they have is very difficult. But I mean, other business angels I know are honest people. And if they're completely full up with handling daily crisis, they will tell you, sorry, but I can't take on any further dialogues. So just ask them. Yeah. So, so, so being super honest and actually have just honest conversation with the investors. Is, they don't the want forward. to waste their own time or the founder's time. So yeah. But they will answer honestly. And I guess the common goal is still when it's your insistent investors is that the company will succeed best possible. Yes. Uh, yeah. um, so, so final question for you, Amanda. Um, so, so we have talked a little bit about that this crisis will create a, the new winners 
uh, and build a, so, so that new winners will come out of uh, come out of the, the crisis. Um, what is the specific main characteristics you envision in these winners, uh, and and what are you searching for uh, when touching upon this in, in this crisis situation? Well, it- I haven't changed. The short version made it. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't changed it focus. Yeah. You know, I haven't changed focus at all. And you shouldn't either change focus on how you, you pick the winners and the ones you want to invest in. It's always going to be team first. Mm. It's always going to be if the founder, the right founder, has he or she or, or they actually understood the world we're living in or about to live in. Have they the right people around them? Do they listen to the advice they are given? Do you have an advisory board? So the team is always going to be the first one you look at anyhow. Then you can look at the traction and then you can look at the product uh, and the impact, of course. So that won't change even though we're in a new world right now. Yeah, so I guess in the team space, there are some characteristics that is like adoptable to chains and, and all that general things that you're searching for in a team. Now that a lot of teams just has to actually to prove it and transform it into a, more than they already are doing it. But like, especially because there are so much pressure on them uh, related to the crisis, it's, it's just enforces that part of characteristic way more uh, as I see it. Yeah. Thank you a lot for, for dialing in and helping us out uh, and, and asking all these questions. And thank you a lot out there for all the activity and all the really good questions on the chat. Uh, so I know maybe we'll just share uh, one slide and then we are actually at the end of this uh, webinar session today. So for those of you who still have some questions that they didn't manage to have uh, answered, please send them in on the, this email address you can see here, nordicgrowth.danskebank.d dot com um, the other webinars upcoming webinars you can uh, find on the homepage and that is also where you can find the recordings of this session so if you want to like revisit it or if you have somebody you want to share it towards on the next slide you'll be able to see the overview of the upcoming uh, webinars so i think you have a, another slide Michael. yes so the upcoming webinars will be these four Tomorrow we'll have a session about being a, in a founder and this crisis is super stressful, stressful. And so how do you secure to take good care of yourself, but also take good care of your team where there are probably big changes. Uh, then we have a session about SaaS models, so dialing in on the SaaS businesses, how to navigate in a crisis and, and what things could you be uh, thinking about or looking into. Uh, then we have, uh, focus on the currencies. So we also see a lot of fluctuations in the currencies uh, these days. How to l- lower your risk in that area and what is the bank's expectations looking forward. And then the last session, uh, which is in a, uh, which is the next week, we will be with focusing on uh, sales and uh, part- partnerships, how to like uh, enforce that and, and keep traction on that uh, in this current situation that we're in. A final thanks to you, Jesper Jarlberg and Mette Flynn for dialing in and helping us us out. It was super valuable and thank you for sharing all your knowledge. Thank you all for dialing in and uh, have a really nice day, everybody. Bye, guys. Thank you. Bye-bye.